Okay. Um, okay, guys, so really happy to introduce Todd and Todd. He's the professor in mechanical and engineering department uh, here at, 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 at Columbia University. Um, he's also director of the Creative Machine Labs, um, which does really creative work at building creative machines. Um, and uh, he has um, yeah, written mul multiple books that have, um, uh, uh, you know, done very well. Um, one book is the fact it's called Fabricate New World of 3D Printing, and another book is Driverless Intelligent Cars on the Road, 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 road Ahead. Um, he's done uh, his TED Talk on AI is one of the most viewed uh, TED, TED Talks on, on AI. Um, and so, yeah, Hot is just, you know, a polymath and has done pretty much a little bit of everything. Um, and really an e e expert at where machine learning hits the physical world, both in terms of hard physics, but also in terms of, 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 of life itself. Um, so I'm really excited to um, have Hod um, give, give a, a talk and um, I'm sure it'll be very enjoyable. Thanks so much for coming Thank down, Hod. It's my pleasure. So it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not gonna talk about any of these uh, driverless cars or uh, uh, 3D printing, none of that. I'm gonna talk about uh, automating discovery, which is a little bit more about how uh, AI can look at physical phenomena and extract the physics out of these phenomena. And I think it's very relevant to the kind of work we're doing here. Um, it's, um, it's really all about automating discovery. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, the, the main message I'd like you to take home in the end is that, uh, I think Pierre and I have argued about this, I remember in the early days of the proposal, whether the end game is a human, machine collaboration in physics and discovering the, how the world works, or is it purely AI? And we humans just collect the data and feed it in and get predictions. So I'm, I think more in the extreme that in the end, the world is too complicated and we just could have had it over to AI. Uh, we just got, our job is to collect the data and collect the right data. Uh, and uh, it will do the rest. Uh, people are all over the spectrum between the Few physics people who want to understand everything all the way down uh, to the AI people who want to hand it over. So uh, truth is somewhere in the middle, but I want to tell a little bit of the story of where we're going. Uh, I think the, you know, uh, I'll, I'll start a little bit of, of my own story in this area. I didn't set out to understand the world from uh, using AI. I set out to build robots. This is uh, my goal, is, uh, has been since I uh, started my academic career, is to make better robots. Uh, and the challenge has always been to make robots that are adaptive. That's the biggest research in uh, frontier in robotics is, is robots are already fast and powerful. Uh, robots can already work 24 seven. It's all solved. The biggest challenge in robotics is making robots that can adapt to unseen situations so they can work and do things they haven't been programmed to do, work in environments they haven't worked in before, uh, and in my case, work when they're broken. If a bolt falls off of this robot, it's game over. Can a robot adapt just like animals can keep on going when they're broken? Mm -hmm. uh, can, can machines repair? All these things, all these adaptation, all this adaptation that we see in the real world, can robots also have the same uh, thing? So, uh, but instead of, uh, uh, instead of trying to build robots, uh, I thought maybe we can breed robots. In other words, we can use evolution to generate new kinds of machines uh, rather than sitting at a desk and designing them as if we know how to design robots. So my postdoc started at Brandeis University, University in Boston, uh, in the, uh, near MIT, whatever that's worth. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it, uh, this is the center of complex systems, uh, which on a good day looks like this. And uh, in that uh, center, I worked with Jordan Pollock and uh, in computer science, and we started to breed robots. And the basic idea was this. We built in a big physics simulation. Uh, physics simulators, uh, this was back in 1999, a previous uh, century, millennium. Uh, you couldn't just download a physics simulator. You had to code it from scratch. So we coded a physics simulator from scratch. Uh, and then we threw in robot parts into it, bars and motors and joints and control elements like neurons and, and, and uh, wires and things like that and sensors. We threw in all this garbage into the big physics simulator and we allowed evolution to put it together randomly and see what works. 
Uh, and then, it, of course, nothing worked. So uh, some, sometimes it, re it recombined things that worked a little less badly than other things. And, uh, and that improved a little bit and, and we wanted to see what would happen. So we sort of let this thing go. Uh, we put it on the biggest uh, parallel computer we could find back then. This is the year 2000 already. This is the Onyx Silicon Graphics 16 processor, killer machine, you know, less than your cell phone today, but that was the state of the art back then. And we hit enter and we watched what happened. And uh, after, uh, about a week. This is generations. Each dot here is a robot. And you can see the speed of the robot, the evolved breeding robot to run across the infinite plane. Uh, you can see in the first week, about a hundred generations, nothing happened. We're just getting piles of junk on the ground. Nothing's moving. Dead end. Okay, my postdoc is not going anywhere. Uh, you know, time to think about a career change. <laughs> I'm about to plug up, plug, uh, unplug the machine and something begins to move. Tiny bit, doesn't move at all. Like a piece of garbage that is vibrating a little bit. But that vibration is infinitely better than the other pieces of garbage that are not moving at all. And so that vibrating piece of garbage begins to uh, take over the, the world uh, and replicate and then more versions and more versions and things begin to move. But long story short, about a week later, uh, we begin to see interesting designs that go out across the infinite plane. These are really, really simple machines in today's terms, but this was exciting enough that I took this and combined it with a new technology that just came out called the 3D printing. And here you are with the first ever 3D printed robot falling across the floor of the lab. And it was not an impressive 3D uh, robot, but it was the first robot to be designed and manufactured almost automatically. Uh, so, uh, so that was it. Uh, that was enough uh, to do maybe things. If you fast forward 20 years, today we can do the same thing, but we use soft robots. It's already 10 years old. Today we can do it even better. Uh, these are evolved soft robots. Soft robots are much harder to simulate. Uh, much more complex to evolve, but still you get lots and lots of interesting machines when you just let them evolve. When they compete, they almost have a personality, right? I mean, they're kind of cool and interesting. Today, this is so easy. I give this as homework assignment number one in my uh, evolutionary computation course, and they make amazing things. Hold on to your questions to the end. So, so uh, we are, uh, so we keep uh, we evolving, we evolve these things. Uh, we also try to figure out how to, uh, how to make these things work physically uh, by developing physical actuators that actually work. This is a, this is a, a soft muscle that we developed in our lab. Uh, and what I'm not telling you here is this is accelerated 25 times, actually very, very slow. Not enough to make a robot, but still, you know, we're, we're working on it. But uh, back to the story, this is, this is one of the nicest robots we made uh, at the end of my postdoc. Uh, and uh, it was difficult to publish this, but it did get into the front page of New York Times, which is all you need to get a faculty position. <laughs> right? And uh, uh, the editor of the New York Times, uh, it was below the fold, in case uh, you're wondering. Uh, the New York Times editor, uh, editor in chief told me the only reason they put it there was because there was nothing else happening in the world at all that day. <laughs> and there was no, nothing else, and they had to put science. I mean, it's August 31st, which is like the day before school. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was nothing else happening, not even bad stuff. And so they had nothing else to put. So they put it there, and I got my faculty position at Cornell University, upstate New York, which on a good day looks like this. Uh, and of course, I uh, the big question for me is can I get uh, you know, I, I, I knew that in mechanical engineering, I'm not going to get tenure making plastic robots. I'm going to make robots out of titanium. And this is one of our first robots. It's a, uh, and I wanted to see if I can make this robot gallop in the field. So, right, this is uh, yeah, 2001. There's no Boston Dynamics yet. The, the field is wide open. All the robots are lame walking machines that can barely you know, step over uh, you know, a twig. 
can we make a robot that will get out from the field? So we built this amazing robot. It has a paintball canister in the center, lots of you know, air valves and amazing power to do backflips and all kinds of things. And the question is, can I make it gallop gracefully through the field? So I put it in a big cage and I ran evolution with my students on the controller of this thing to open and close the valves. And it's a big cage, there's a camera at the top to track where the robot is. It gives reward to different controllers. Controllers crossbreed with other good controllers like a rodeo show. And then the best ones get to ride this robot. And after a while, leaving this overnight, we got some interesting behaviors. Here's some of these robots playing back. I don't know if you can have audio, but you can imagine the clicking and clacking of this machine, but it's not going anywhere. <laughs> okay, it actually towards the end, it walked a little bit, but we're not gonna take over the world with this thing. And neither was I gonna get tenure. This is three years into the, it's a big program, a lot of money, but this robot is very little to show for it, right? So, so evolution on the physical robot is not going anywhere. So to summarize to this point, I have two. Live transcription is great. Let me turn this off. Do you mind just turning this off so I, don't, I got the message? Oh, oh, I have to move it. It's not Yeah. All right. Yes. I'm gonna move Click here. Okay, so uh, two projects I showed you. The first one, all in simulation. Uh, we breed it in simulation. The best one gets to go into reality. We cross our fingers and uh, it worked, but it only worked because the robots were really, really simple. Dynamics were simple, everything was simple. Uh, the second part, so it wasn't impressive. So this only uh, works uh, because the robots were simple and what we call the simulation reality gap is small. All right, doesn't work for real uh, projects. The second project that I showed you, there was no simulation. It's all happening on the physical robot. It works really, it, well, it doesn't work uh, simply because it takes too many physical trials on the physical robot. You can do things on a physical robot, but physical robots are slow, expensive. Uh, they wear out. It's, it's, it's complicated to do evolution on physical robots. So in simulation, it works, but doesn't transfer. In reality, it works, but it's too slow. In other words, it doesn't scale either way. So what do we do? I have two more years for my tenure. Lock, I got to find an alternative solution. So. I went back and what we did is a sort of hybrid mix. And this is how it works. Start off with a simulator that's bad, right? Uh, we then evolve robot in it. And by the way, if you're interested in simulating NFXL systems, you can sort of draw the analogy here between what we're doing here and what you want to simulate. We start with a crude simulator. We evolve robots. We try them in reality. They don't work, but we collect data. And then we use that data to evolve better simulators. And this is sort of the cycle. Once we have better simulators, we evolve new robots and the cycle continues. In other words, we now are optimizing two things at the same time. We're optimizing the simulators and the robots. So there's two things co-adapting at the same time. Uh, the, in the evolutionary computation field, this is called co-evolution. It happens all the time, predator prey, uh, symbiosis. Uh, Biology is always co-evolving. There's never anything evolving at the same time. In AI, this is called adversarial learning. There's a relationship between these two things. The, the robots take advantage of quirks in the simulator. The simulator uh, is, uh, tries to explain away observations uh, from real robots. So they, they have a, it's not adversarial, maybe student uh, professor kind of relationship. It's kind of mixed, but they both lift each other up and it begins to work. Here's the last, uh, this is the 
robots on the title page. A four-legged machine. Uh, this robot needs to learn how to walk. Uh, this this was our last experiment uh, uh, back then. Uh, it has uh, four. It has eight motors, two on each leg, one in the foot, and one one at the knee, and one at the hip. It only has two sensors which tell you if it's tilted left and right, forward and backward. And this robot needs to learn how to walk. But the, here's the challenge. It does not know what it looks like. Unlike robots that learn in simulation or robots that learn in the physical world, this has no simulation, does not know what it looks like, nothing. All it has is these two angles that it's tilted and access to eight motors, but it doesn't even know if it's a snake, a spider, a tree, a robotic arm, a worm. It doesn't know anything about anything. But uh, so it's a bit like a, a brain of a newborn child, maybe that has access to all kinds of muscles and it needs to learn how to, what it is in order to do things. So the robot begins by making uh, random motions and making hypotheses about what it might be. Path hypotheses that are compatible with data it's collecting from its random motion. Once it has this, uh, these models, and this is where it connects to, to automated science. It looks for how to actuate these, these models. What actuation activity creates the most disagreement between these models? Okay, this is like a scientist thinking about what boundary condition creates the most disagreement between two competing models, uh, between two competing theories. And then data from the real experiment will refute at least one of those theories. And then goes and back and does that action, refutes all of the models, look how to make them disagree again and goes back in a circle at the end when the models cannot be made to disagree anymore. They converge. It figures out how to walk in the simulation it created. And because it matches reality, what makes the robot move makes the, the simulation makes it move in reality in the same way. So we started off, uh, and this here's the robot building a simulation of itself. It's gonna move randomly, collect data, and understand what it is. At least that was the hope. We turn it on. And bam, it unplugs itself and dies, <laughs> right? And that was the end of that robot. Uh, and the, the goal here, the, the message here, you can't explore too far beyond what you know. This is this risk of exploration, right? You don't want to walk off a cliff to find out you can fly, right? This is, is there's risk inherent in exploration. So we tame it down a little bit. And uh, there it is, uh, exploring itself. Here are some models it's creating. In the beginning, they're all wrong. This takes about four days. Uh, this was uh, more than a decade ago. Again, today, you could do it on your cell phone, but here it is, gradually exploring itself. Uh, two days into the process, it figured out that it has four legs, but doesn't quite know how they're connected. And this is about four days into the process. It pretty much figured out what it is. It's not perfectly accurate, but this stick figure is good enough that it can learn how to walk in its, its, inside its own simulation. And it's learning how to walk. It takes another day to learn how to walk in simulation. Again, it's inside the simulation it built of itself. And here it is walking in reality. Again, we had sound, the amazing clickety-clack sound of the machine walking for the first time without having done trials in physical world, without being programmed, without having a model of itself enough. Okay, to test this, we did something very cool. We blocked off a leg. We watched what happened. The robot, uh, of course, is, doesn't know what happened, but its dynamics do not match uh, its predictions. And it goes back into the self-modeling, continues to adapt its model, and its model also loses to the leg. And it's not because you know there was a, a, a leg came off and there was a sensor that said leg came off, switch to plan B. This all happened spontaneously. The dynamics changed, the model changed, the behavior changed. And again, we're, we're after this holy grail of adaptation, spontaneous adaptation in machines. And this is the key here is self-modeling. And this is this uh, thing could potentially do a lot of interesting things. Here's a 30 independent runs starting at the origin. Red dots are where a random controller makes the robot move. Black dots are where the robot believes it's going to get to using its own simulation. Blue dots are where it actually gets to physical reality. Which means that the robot, like anything else in academia, has an inflated self-image. It believes it can go twice as far as it really can. However, 
even though the model is wrong, it still allows the robot to learn how to walk. And this is really interesting because you can see that evolution, we engineers are obsessed with accuracy of our simulation. Evolution doesn't care about accuracy. As long as you're making the right decisions with your model, you're good. Don't waste time on getting things accurate because some things you can't get accurate. You just need to get the gradient right. So this is kind of interesting for me. I give talks about this in uh, social science conferences because people want to know to what degree is our self-image important. And it's interesting here that, that inflated self models allow the robot to move forward. Deflated models, uh, the signal to noise ratio is too poor for the robot to make any decision. This is really, really interesting from a psychology point of view and how we see ourselves and so on. But, but let me move on and, and talk a little bit about what happened next. Uh, that was a long time ago before deep learning. Deep learning came along and of course, whatever you did before, you now do again with deep learning. So this is what we do here. This robot is learning to move in the beginning. Uh, this is completely from scratch, has no knowledge of physics. You can see the robot in the background does not know what it is. And this is about after eight hours of training. You see the shadow is the self model and the physical robot in the foreground. It's not perfect, but it's good enough that this robot can learn to behave. And, and again, our human self image is also not accurate. If you close your eyes, just do this for a second with me. Close your eyes and touch your nose. With your eyes closed from far away. Okay, I can see some of you are missed. All right. Uh, if you got it on, okay, if you got it on the dot, awesome. But most of you have missed. I was watching carefully each and one, every one of you. You got it off by about one centimeter. All right. This is the accuracy of a self model. Uh, this robot gets it right about uh, one inch. All right. So it's not as good as humans, but it's getting there. All right, so this robot can see itself, envision itself. And, uh, you know, again, the same thing. We took a piece of the robot, we replaced it with a crooked part, and we let the robot move. And after a brief recalibration, the robot creates a new model of itself and can keep on doing what it did before with this new model. Okay, uh, this is a really recent, this is just, uh, just came out. Uh, and uh, maybe with Carl, even, I'm not sure about this one. Maybe uh, in science, uh, science robotics, uh, this is a statistical model of the robot. The robot prances around in front of a camera and creates a statistical model of itself. You can see the physical robot in the foreground and this, this kind of fog behind it, that's how it sees itself. And as it moves on, it can use that to plan to move forward. So these self models are getting more and more sophisticated. Uh, I want to see how far we can push this. And, and I really uh, believe that in the end of the day, our that self awareness has to do with being able to see yourself in the future. And that's what these robots are going to do. All right. So we have a self model of ourselves, and this is what it is. Here's some more examples the ground truth, the self model. So it's getting more and more accurate. Uh, these robots are learning to see themselves. So another offshoot of that research are robots that model other robots, not just themselves, but looking at other robots, trying to understand what the other robot is like, what it can do, um, what it's planning, uh, and so on. So we did some interesting uh, work on hide and seek, uh, where the robots need to, the hider needs to predict how the seeker can see it or not. So it has to model. So hide and seek is a very sophisticated game where you have to see the world from another person's point of view in your imagination. And so it involves a lot of this self model and other modeling. So we're trying to create these interesting games where that involve machines learning to see themselves from their own point of view and from the point of view of others. And I think it's very important uh, you know, to how machines will eventually integrate uh, in our society. All right, so that's a whole line of research. We, we're still working on it, but that's not what I'll talk about. I want to talk a little bit about this question of system identification, which is uh, at this point, I finally got tenure and a new student came into the lab and said, all you are trying to do here is create models of a system from partial observations where you can perturb the inputs 
in order to extract the most information from each observation. So let's try to do it for some other systems. So, so we'll pick an arbitrary experimental system, uh, collect data from it, just like you connected from the robot, create models of it, but instead of models being building blocks, mechanical building blocks, we'll make models made of differentially algebraic building blocks, same thing. Instead of experiments being how to move the motors, we're going to change initial conditions and boundary conditions on the models. We're going to simulate them, find out what initial conditions and boundary conditions make these models disagree. Find those, apply them in reality, get more data, refute some of the models, do this again, and eventually we'll get a model of whatever system we're exploring. It sounds like a simple thing. It's a very, uh, it's a straightforward adaptation of what we did before, with the exception that it's very easy to, to collect data on a robot. The robot can do the whole thing. With a physical experiment, it's harder to collect data. What do you do that? So you can have a human collecting data for the robot, which is an interesting turn of the turning of the tables, right? We always thought computers will, will collect data and we will come up with a hypothesis. That's how most scientists saw the future. Now, humans collecting the data, computers are coming up with the hypothesis. Not exactly how we want it to play out, but we'll take it. Option number two, robots also collect the data for the other robot that's making the hypothesis. Option number three is you just collect data, like in atmospheric sciences, where you can't easily do experiments. And then, Put them in a big database and when the robot wants to do an experiment you look up the closest thing you have in your database and you pull it out and said we did the experiment here's here's the here's the answer and this is kind of a little bit realistic this is the way most most of this automated science ends up being done and you can create them all so we tried this a lot of things this is uh, i was at cornell at the time if you ever been to cornell anybody here been to cornell university upstate very far away but you know, like I think it's a uh, it's two weeks walk from here, <laughs> very far. If you get there, uh, it's a beautiful place, but it's surrounded by gorges. It's very uh, easy to defend, very difficult to attack. This is the uh, bridge leading into Cornell. I walk this every morning, uh, and it's very wobbly. And when you walk it, you always wonder what would happen if it would break. At least I did. And so we, uh, we did this, so we applied this technique to this uh, problem. We uh, attached vibrators to different locations of the bridge. We vibrate it. We measure vibrations at the other location. And we try to find out, create models that explain the vibrations, and then look to how to vibrate the bridge again to make these models disagree and go back and forth. And we can find out more accurately and faster than any civil engineering approach how to you know, find a broken piece in the bridge. And so you can do use this with structural identification. This is an example of uh, just applying this, this co-evolutionary idea to modeling other things. Here's another example, analog circuit in a black box. I made it a little bit transparent, but I don't think you can see it. Uh, how do you actuate the analog circuit to expose what's inside? And if you do that for a while, you can find out pretty much what's inside. And this is a nonlinear analog circuit, very difficult to reverse engineer any other way. You cannot do it using conventional methods, but you can do it using this thing. And these patterns are generated automatically to maximize information coming out so this uh, extraction can work. So you can see almost a, you know, a scientist interrogating a nonlinear system and extracting a model. Okay, this is uh, Arguably, this is all of science is, is doing that, right? So we do all kinds of things. So that brings me to this last example. So you can see you can apply it to different things. It all depends on what building block you use. Uh, and so I want to use algebraic building blocks and apply it to the most general data system, which is just a collection of data points. So that brings me this idea called symbolic regression, uh, which uh, is all about modeling a system uh, finding out what is the equation that explains data. So here I have a couple of points. Anybody know what the function that creates, created this uh, point R? To be brave enough to guess. Is a straight X line. Sin X. What? X, X sin X. X. Okay, that's good. That's pretty close. 
It's uh, exponent. Uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty close. All right. So if you're trying to do this in your head, you are not doing linear regression. You were thinking, okay, there's a sign, maybe a cosine, there's exponent, maybe not, maybe a linear. You're trying to take these, these building blocks and put them together to qualitatively explain what's going on. So, uh, so we call that symbolic regression as opposed to linear regression. The nonlinear regression we we, we fine tune coefficients. Uh, and again, arguably, this is something that normally machines don't do. Right? We we do the we like to do this part, and then we let the computer fine tune the coefficients. But the idea here is we let the computer actually search for the symbols for the actual uh, exponent. So, uh, and uh, you know, since you did it so quickly, what's this one? You can answer this. Okay, I'm kidding. It's harder and harder the higher dimensions there are. This is okay. That's not good enough. Uh, this is. Uh, um, I'll show you what it is in a moment. But this is again one-dimensional function. You can do it. What about twenty dimensions? We can, right? So the way we do it is we read equations represented as trees. This is. Uh, you know, x minus three times sine of x plus minus seven, right? So this, we read these equations. In the beginning, they don't match the data. The error is high. We, we crossbreed them, all these things. And eventually we get equations that explain the data. So, so it's a very simple idea. Uh, and uh, if we do that, we might, uh, it might work. So this is an idea, old idea, uh, proposed by John Cosa in 1992, uh, who, uh, was at Stanford, and then he invented uh, in the lottery. If you ever did lottery, there's this glue you have to scrape off the ticket. He has a patent on the on the on the glue. All right. Oh, you cannot like photograph it, like scan. So, uh, so uh, he has a patent on the glue. So he left uh, Stanford, uh, and uh, he's a, a rich person. But uh, he invented this technique, but. And it's an amazing idea, except that it doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? It's the same reason any machine uh, learning algorithm doesn't work, and that is because it's too slow uh, and it tends to overfit the data. So what we did is a very simple adaptation. We evolve models to fit the data, except we don't fit to the entire data set. We only fit to a few points. You see these red points? Where, are the, where do we put these red points? These red points also evolve, and they move around to defeat these models. They move around to where these models disagree about their predictions. If all the models can explain this curve here, the, these red dots will move away from these red dots, from this area. So it's a predator prey, again, adversarial learning, a model that try, models that try to model data and data that tries to escape being modeled. They go back and forth, they chase each other around, but over time, it works in an incredible way. This is one of our first applications, Windows uh, 2000 or whatever, uh, points jumping around, the same data I said I gave you, it's too low resolution to see, but very quickly it models it and it comes back with X, exponent of X times sine of absolute value of X, right? Perfect. So uh, you can see the points jumping around. Uh, so if we ran this uh, and we found these interesting things, if you model, if you use the entire data set, it kind of gets better over time, random subsampling, dynamic subsampling. But if you use uh, just the coevolution, you get the, uh, the uh, solution that's more accurate and you get it sooner. And this is counterintuitive. You would think that using the entire data set is always the best thing. Why would you throw away data? Well, here it says, no, if you use a subset of the data, but a subset that has been evolved to defeat the models, you get better answers. So, so it's sort of active learning, uh, query by committee, all kinds of uh, uh, ideas baked in here, two things co-adapting at the same time, and you get better. Not only do you get it better, but if you use the entire data set, you get models that are more complex than if you use co-evolved data sets where you get simpler models with the same accuracy. So if it's simpler and just as accurate, it's closer to the truth, Occam's razor, and I think this is what is happening here. So what do we do with this? Of course, we uh, try to predict the stock market. Why not? New York. 
Uh, of course, that didn't work. I'm still here. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, we try to do something else. So we uh, try to predict the prime numbers. Uh, another uh, cool little project that didn't work either. We did find known relationships between prime numbers, but nothing, no formula. All right. Not going to be rich or famous. So we wrote some papers explaining how to do this. And we got an email from this group in CERN who said, um, uh, we have this uh, challenge. It's called the binding energy of atomic nuclei. I don't understand what it is exactly, but they have the data. They sent over the data. They said, if you can model it, uh, let us know. We want the equation. We ran this thing, we got a beautiful equation. This is what we got. Explains the relationship to three digits. Amazing. I email the guy at CERN and he emails me back. He says, we already know about this formula. Yeah. It's called Weizsäcker's formula and our formula is good to four digits. So he was disappointed, but I was actually very excited. We can find named formulas from data. Uh, who else, you know, who knows what else we can find, right? I mean, it's an incredible thing. So to take it up a notch, we said, let's not just model static data, let's model dynamics. So we, we take time series data, we compute the derivatives. Now we have derivatives of the data, easier, only, easier said than done, but let's say you can do it. Uh, and now we model the data to the derivatives, so we get differential equations. And we tried it out on glycolysis, a data on glycolysis cycle of the cell. And we get back all seven nonlinear differential equations of the model of the glycolysis cycle. Again, I don't know what that means exactly, but there's a lot of data about this. And we get back uh, the equations from scratch. Amazing. Uh, and before we move on, uh, you know, at the time, uh, as Carl mentioned earlier, we did a lot of work on 3D printing. We still do. We made this robot that flaps its wings and flies like a mosquito. That was another project that somebody was working on. Uh, and the, the question was, how much lift does a flapping wing create? And this is a very complicated aerodynamic, uh, elasto, uh, turbulent, you know, all the bad things combined, okay? And then how do we uh, measure the lift of this? So we, so we did a lot of experiments, collected the data, and we saw, let's see if we can create an equation, a formula for the lift or the aeroelastic wing, okay, a very complicated thing. Uh, and I don't want to show you the answer. It's not interesting uh, for this talk, but I want to compare it to the state of the art equation. This is where it gets interesting. And I want to compare it on two axes. On, and we, you can use that for all of science. Accuracy and complexity. You have models that are simple, but not very accurate, every point I make. Actually, it's pretty accurate. Uh, you have models that are, uh, you know, they, they're good enough, right? You have models that are very accurate, but they're too complex, or they're complex and use them in some situations, but they're very accurate. Now, of course, we all want to be here, right? This is a Nobel Prize, but this is where most of us end up, right? It's the whole space of scientific thinking. So, where do the models coming out of this process end up? So, we did a large uh, literature review. Here are all the models at the time for air elastic lift, different uh, degrees of accuracy and uh, different degrees of complexity. We measure it complexity by the amount of ink taken to write down the model, the equation, the crude measure, but that's what we have. And here are the models created by our system. And the important thing is that they are, these models are simpler and more accurate than the models created by people. So, it's, this is not a neural network that, that has a billion parameters that can make accurate uh, predictions. This is simpler than models published by experts in this area. This is where we're going. These are polynomial fits from the same data, and we're sort of on the right side of the tracks. Okay, uh, lots of examples. This another student came in, wanted to model road tire interaction. I thought it's a noble cause. Or, uh, you know, for making cars safer? He said, no. Uh, I, I said, uh, is it uh, um, for making cars more efficient? He said, no. So I said, okay, why are you trying to do this? He said, for video games. For 
making video against better. All right, whatever the reason, he modeled this and he got models that are better and more accurate than state of the art models by the automotive industry. So, again, you get models that are interesting, they're understandable, and so on. So, I, I started giving talks just like this, and at the end of this point, I would say, Give me your data, I'll give you a model. Let's collaborate. You have data, I have this hammer, and we're going to take the nails in the hammer and we're going to create lots of interesting things. So, so uh, uh, usually people don't want to share the data. This is this is always been a problem. Uh, but uh, this guy, Grohl Sewell, came to me in the end of the talk and he said, I have the perfect data set. I'm doing these experiments with, with some, uh, some bacteria that I can't pronounce. And uh, I have these dynamics collected from individual cells. Uh, I can give you all these dynamics and maybe you can create a model that explains it for all the cells. And he gave me 60 cells to uh, track time tracks for every cell, maybe you can get them all. So they give me the cell, I ran it, and um, uh, after about a week, we get these two models. And it looked like great, these two differential equations that explain the entire data set. And I email Gural and uh, I say, Here we have the models. And he says, This is total garbage. It's not related to biology, it's uh, second order. There's no second order in biology. This is not relevant. It's complete garbage. So what do we do? So we went back and we figured that we're using the wrong building blocks. We're using sine and cosine, for example, which are irrelevant to biology. Biology doesn't have sine and cosine. Biology has different building blocks that we're not putting in. So we scratched our heads and rubbed our chin and found and thought that maybe we need a new building block called time delays. The biology, there's a lot of time delays. Nothing happens exactly. We threw in the time delays, and bam, we get this beautiful model that explains everything. And email Guru and say, I have the model for you. And he says, we have a problem. Here's the models I published, and your models are more accurate and simple. But there's one challenge. We have no clue what this means. He wrote his paper and he can explain every little comma in this thing. And we have no, it's like copying the whole one for someone. And you can submit it, but you don't know how you got there. And you can't explain anything. And this is exactly where we are. We cannot explain what we have. And it works on new data sets and unseen data sets and all kinds of things. But we can't explain how we don't understand the physics. You have the answer, we don't understand the physics. We can't publish this. Reviewers don't say you can't publish it if you don't understand what it means. We still have not published it. The students has graduated, moved on. What do we do with this? Put it on archive. Maybe. So it brings me to the last topic, which is the search for meaning. Not this kind, but the actual meaning of equations. Because as AI moves forward, we get answers without rationale. And this is always going to be an increasing challenge for these automated systems. Correlations are not enough. This is a classic example. People analyze data at supermarket, found out that people that buy diapers on Thursdays also buy beer. <laughs> it's true. And if you run a supermarket, you don't care why, you move the beer next to the diapers and you sell more. <laughs> but if you are a scientist, you always want to know why. What is driving it? What's the causality behind these things? What's driving everything? And so it brings me to this next challenge, which was, okay, let's take a system like a pendulum. And let's say you can measure angular and angular velocity of uh, this pendulum. And I ask you not to predict what's gonna happen next. I ask you what is not changing about angular and angular velocity? Is there some constant? Is the ratio constant? What is the invariant of angular, angle and angular velocity? Anybody know? Okay, the answer is the total energy. Okay, the total energy of the pendulum is invariant. It's constant. Kinetic energy plus potential energy, assuming friction is go, goes away, but generally speaking, it is more or less constant. And if you, so that's called the Hamiltonian 
of the, of the pendulum. And if you figure out the Hamiltonian of the pendulum, you know everything there is to know about the dynamics. It's the answer for the pendulum. So the question is, can we use a system, not the model dynamics, but to find invariants? And again, there are papers from the 18th century saying how all of science is the search for invariants. All the uh, constituent laws, everything that we look for are invariants. F equal and MA is an invariant. We're looking for invariants. Laws of nature are nothing but invariants. Symmetries, they're all invariants. So we're looking for invariants. So uh, we said, okay, this is really simple. We just need to search for things that don't change. Took the data, this is from a double pendulum. And we searched for an equation, not an equation that models the dynamics, but an equation, a formula that remains roughly constant across the entire data set. In other words, we try to minimize the variance of the equation across the entire data set. All right, so we put it in, we hit enter, and we wait. So we wait for a week, and finally the bell rings, and we get the answer, and the answer comes out as constant. And it's true, a constant is invariant across the entire data set. This is a formula that is invariant, but it's useless. Of course, a constant is constant. So how do you reward a system for finding a formula that is constant? Again, you get constants. So we said, okay, let's force it to have the variables in you can't just put a constant, has to put a formula that uses the variables in the data set and is constant. So we force it and it comes back with this. <laughs> uses the variables and it's constant. And they say, no, but it's okay. So we, we eliminate the symbolic and, and it comes back with this, which is almost <laughs> constant. And it's just like arguing with a teenager. We're not getting anywhere. <laughs> And it's just giving us garbage. So it's a, it was a really difficult thing. And think about it. Searching for invariants is really tricky because there's lots of invariants, but they're useless. So how do you find the invariant? Uh, so we, we tried this uh, for a long time and eventually I gave it as homework assignment in my course. This is what I do when I can't uh, solve it. I, I, I really did this when course in evolutionary algorithms. I said, here are three data sets, find the invariants. You know, assignment three, question 3A, three what is the fitness criteria for an invariant? As if I know the answer, all right? Uh, nobody could do it except one student who said, yeah, it's easy. This is what it is. Blah, and then you solve the three things, all right? So I called him to my office and said, okay, explain. He said, this is how I did it. You take the, you compute the, you have a candidate function F, you can compute the F dx and the F dy symbolically, and the ratio between them gives you the X dy. You take the data, you compute the derivatives, you compute the X dy, and you compare the two and it cannot cheat. It has to work. I said, Excellent. I knew this. Uh, and uh, let's try it out on a few more things. So we tried it out on a few more things. Uh, and uh, this example of, uh, you know, physics 101 uh, oscillator, uh, collect data from it, blah, 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 very easy with a webcam. And after it works for a while, it comes back to the Hamiltonian and Lagrangian, and while you add it, you get the two uh, of, of the system. And we ran it again on a, on a pendulum and we get the Hamiltonian Lagrangian of the pendulum. We ran it on a double oscillator. This is already quite difficult. Double oscillator, what's, what's not changing about the, the red and the green curve? I mean, it kind of looks like random. If you ask me, it's, yeah, it's a sine wave, maybe with some offset. No, this is what it is and it's perfect. It's exactly the Hamiltonian of a double oscillator purely from the data, right? And again, this is the uh, Steve Strogatz, uh, king of double pendulums. Here's, he is with a double pendulum. Uh, we collected the data. This is the data I showed you earlier. We collected it by tracking uh, LED in the dark, beautiful, you know, modern art. 
uh, and uh, you collect it. You say, what's invariant about this? So it runs for about a day. We're hitting all kinds of models. Remember, looking at data that defeats the models. And after a while, it comes back with this. And it says, this is not changing. This is, this is the Hamiltonian of a double pendulum, conservation of energy, F equal MA, all kinds of things, all found in the double pendulum. Uh, and with this, of course, we went back to our uh, bacteria that we didn't know what was not changing there. And we found that the invariant of the bacteria, which happens to be the competence level of the bacteria. Competence is how much the bacteria wants to exchange genetic material with other bacteria. Very important for bacterial survival. That's what's driving the entire dynamics. That's what the equations represent. So we got the meaning out of it, but I still haven't published it because the student just left and you know, when the student leaves, paper dies. So I showed you examples in physics and biology, uh, but since then uh, you can do a lot of things. You can add noise as a building block. So you go stochastic mechanics, you can change your building blocks to be reaction. Uh, and then you get reaction models for ecological and chemical systems hybrid systems that switch dynamics in the middle. I mean, you can play around with the building blocks, you get different things, but there's one last thing I wanna talk about, which, which kind of bothered me the whole time. And that is that, you remember I, I showed you this example, I told you create a model with angle and angular velocity. How did I know that angle and angular velocity are the things to measure? Like, this is just a pendulum. How do they even know about angular velocity? It's a deep concept. If you went back a thousand years and talked to whoever, the big brain, the Leonardo da Vinci, I don't know who lived there then, and you say, talk about angular velocity. You think they didn't know what you're talking about? It's a new concept. How do we come up with these variables? And arguably, finding the variables is harder than finding the Hamiltonian. It, once you know what the right variables are, finding the model with these variables is easy. How do we find the variables? So arguably, we automated in this. We automated uh, this step of going from the variables to the equation. But how do we go from the observations to the variables? This is arguably even harder. In creating a model on the variable. Uh, so step two is hard, but step one is a lot harder than step two. Uh, how can we automate this? Uh, so, uh, so that's what we did in this project. I'll just show you some brief results. We look at the double pendulum. It's a real double pendulum. And we first, all we do is we just do um, uh, video prediction. We just say, okay, predict the next frames of the double pendulum. Uh, and we can predict it quite uh, a few frames into the future. You can, if I align them so you can see the predictions are, are pretty close to reality. Amazing. You can predict the dynamics of the double pendulum. If it can do that, it clearly knows about the Hamiltonian deep inside. Now we just have to extract that. It, it knows something about the physics. To extract it out of the deep network. This is the deep network with a gazillion parameters. It knows the answer and I'm gonna extract it from the neural network, all right? So we let it model uh, and we first we ask, okay, how many variables do you need to make that video? From frame to frame, how many, how many variables do you need to pass forward? 1,000, 900, 850, how many? Uh, so we, uh, the way we do it, this is a quarter decoder, a deep network, but we quench this, we throttle this latent space as tight as we can. There's a lot of clever math that I don't understand behind how to quench it. You don't just quench it because it doesn't work. You have to do it in, in, in gradually and in all kinds of tricks. But in the end, when you do it, you get the answer that there are 4.7 variables going from here to the next which we know is true. There are four variables driving a double pendulum. The AI said 4.7, so it's, it's pretty close. From this 50,000 pixels going from here to here, there's only 4.7 numbers that matter. 
that's magic to me because it, it's the beginning of telling me there's only four variables in this thing. In fact, the 0 0.7 probably has to do with the fact that there's pixelation and maybe this pendulum vibrated uh, out of plane and, and maybe somebody opened the door in the middle and all kinds of things like that. All right, so uh, we did it for other things. What are the number of variables required to explain this fireplace uh, Christmas movie, Christmas loop? Okay, the answer is, first of all, it makes the predictions, which to me is astonishing. That you can predict how the fire is going to play out. Uh, and it tells me there are 24 variables. That's it. With 24 variables, you can explain all this thing here. Uh, and we did it for lots of different systems and uh, real and simulated. Some we know the answer, some we don't. And it gives us answers that are pretty much close to the ground truth when we know the ground truth. Uh, of course, the big question is, okay, so what are the variables? Now, here it gets, uh, this is where I lose the track of this story. Every time you run it, you get different variables, and the variables don't mean anything to us mortal, all right? This is the real variables versus the variables come, can come up and come up with a system. Not correlated, not related, not linear combination. It's not energy. It's not angles. It's not angular velocity. It's something. This is for... A single pendulum. I thought this would be trivial. It's not trivial. It's coming up with crazy things, uh, but we have just found a way to put all kinds of additional constraints on the system to force the system, the variables to be smooth. And when you force the variables to be smooth, they become, get closer and closer to, to variables that we humans, we physicists choose to bear, to, uh, Describe it. So these are the variables function of time, very romantic uh, picture, uh, very philosophically meaningful. But the reality is we still don't know what the variables mean. This is for a single pendulum. We have no clue what the variables mean. Uh, we can plot beautiful plots, but we don't know what, what they mean. So I kind of want to end with this big quest that I think if you look historically on great physicists, the, the, the greatness, I think, is not in finding the equation, which we usually name after them. It's in finding the variables. Newton's great accomplishment, in my mind, is not writing F equal MA. It's coming up with the concept of acceleration. Before Newton, nobody talked about acceleration. You had speed and you had going faster. But the idea of acceleration as a quantity that you can then use in physics Nobody ever did it. Once you know about acceleration, this is a really easy equation to find. So finding the variables is by far harder than finding the models. And this is, this is my conclusion here. Uh, New York Times said about our work, uh, theoretical physicists are not yet obsolete, but scientists have taken steps towards it to explain to themselves. And that is exactly not true because the key is assigning meaning and finding the variables uh, upon which to build the models, because building the models is easy. The AI can do that. But finding the equations and finding the variables to begin with, that's the next big challenge. Uh, and that's, I think, where if we can master it, we'll do great things. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Hud. So we'll uh, take any questions. And we also have some on online. Any questions in the room? Yeah. For the millions of viewers. Uh, yeah. there. Yes, sir. Thanks so much. Very interesting. Um, so I was wondering about the state variables that you were showing. So do we need to observe the whole system? Like, for example, the image that you have for double pendulum, if I crop that image and pass only half of that. Great question. The hidden variables. Uh, can we spot? That's a great question. Uh, we should try that. Uh, hopefully, the answer is no. Uh, we don't need to watch the entire system, right? Because that's a, already a, a big question is uh, what to include. And that's always a struggle, right? Uh, should I include this extra variable or can I ignore it? That's a great question. We should try that. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. just, 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 just to follow up, imagine you actually have a, a, a weight at the end of the second one that's out of the frame. 
And I would expect the degree of freedom of your latent space would increase from 4.7 to another. Uh, if the weight is constant, no. But if the oh, weight okay. is part is, is variable. If the string, that's swing. I mean, arguably, there's gravity affecting the pedal, but you can't see it. So, so as long as it's models, the dynamics, and. Yeah, like a ball on a, on a spring or something. I think I, well, so if yeah, so we so if so what happens if the ball is not visible? I think as long as it affects the dynamics and the the changing dynamics are visible, I think it can be found. But you know, right, I'm just saying that you're found four point seven degree freedom. Then you know that's the I think. Oh, the point seven. Yeah, the four point seven may increase to suggest. Or yeah, something right. Like that. Oh, right. To tell you that there's more. Uh, that's 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 my right. Point. right. Okay. So so maybe the answer is you'll find out. That there are more variables, but you won't find out what they are. So, so but this is a really good question. Any other questions? Yeah, me too. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, so I just have one question. So you showed that when you don't know something, evolution starts from a simple model and then it moves on to the right direction, accuracy doesn't matter. So, and then you show the double pendulum. So I'm thinking if you started with a very simple model there, like with, you know that okay, ideally okay. you need five variable, but if you started to right. somehow start with one variable to right. try. So I think, I, so it's okay, a very, very deep question there. Um, so the difference between the first part of the talk is that the robot needs to learn to walk. So it's not modeling itself as a scientist because it wants to know what it is. It's modeling itself because it needs to walk. So the model is not important. The walking is important. So we call this modeling for control. So if you model something in order to control it, you don't care about the model. As long as the control works, you're good. As scientists, we sometimes create a model because we want the model not because we're doing it for control. And if you're doing the model for the sake of modeling, then you really want it to be accurate. If you're doing the model for the sake of control, you're willing to settle for approximations. So you can do one variable approximation and it's fine. Yeah, yeah. But I, what I meant is that uh, if you would start from one variable and then add oh, more gradually, uh, Well, so we don't tell the AI how many variables to use. We just say, first of all, make the video predictions, and it uses 50,000 variables yeah. because it's a deep neural network. And then we trim it down and see how far it goes. So we start from the top okay. and we see how far we can go. Yeah. The, the evolution goes from the bottom. You're right. The evolution starts low and goes up. Deep learning starts from everything and then narrows down. So, yeah. Good. That's yeah. a good uh, distinction. Thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? I'm not sure online I can ask Monica, so we don't have any questions. So thanks again, Laura. Right, really you. interesting talk. Yeah, thanks thank so much.